So my name is Tina Shabaka. I am here from ReGlobal. I'm the executive director. I'm based in San Francisco, which is where our headquarters are based. But the work that we do is in three countries, Bhutan, India, and Nepal. Um, actually, sorry, this slide is a little bit outdated. But um, this, we actually have, oh, it's not up. So we've been working in Nepal since 1991. That's where we started our work. Um, and then more recently, with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we expanded into India in 2008 and then into Bhutan a year later. Um, we've opened 79 read centers, which are effectively community libraries, and I'll explain that in just a minute. And our reach is about 2.1 million rural villagers have access to the programs and resources in a read center. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through the model in order to keep things brief. So this is a read center in Nepal, um, and that's really the platform for everything else that happens within the community. So a read center consists of a library section with three to 5,000 books, a women's section which has special resources relevant to women in rural villages especially, and then a children's section with child-friendly educational materials, books, and a safe space for women who want to come visit the library to leave their children. And then information communications technology, as Ari was just explaining, in many of our centers, this might be the one place in the whole community where someone can come access the internet for free. It might be the only internet access, actually, in the entire community, and then learn, actually, how to use a computer to find the information that they need. Then we have training programs that we offer, and a lot of these happen through partnerships. Um, but it might be literacy programs, livelihood skills training, educational programs. And then a unique part of our model, and it was actually music to my ears, and, and the woman has actually left the room, but the woman who so adamantly made the point about libraries should really be s sustainable. They should be self-sustaining. We shouldn't be dependent on government funding. That is exactly our model. We don't get government funding. Um, we fund the libraries ourselves, and then we partner with the community that co-invests with us. But then we have what we call sustaining enterprises, which generate income. They're community businesses that generate income to make sure that the library can stay open to the community for years to come. And then through partnerships, which I'm going to get into in just a second, we offer a lot of different programs and opportunities for people in the community. And then community initiative, which is so important to our model, is when the community takes it upon themselves to use this incredible resource that's been established in their community to launch some of their own programs and maybe launch new businesses um, after the initial sustaining enterprise has been set up. So I think this is the most important part of our model, is really the work that we do in mobilizing the community initially that they, we require them to actually co-invest. So we ask for an investment of a minimum of 10 to 15% of the total cost to set up a read center. We ask for the community to either fundraise that cost. Sometimes they might actually donate the entire building that's going to be converted into a read center. Sometimes they donate the land. But they need to make some sort of co-investment so that we can see from the very beginning they're bought into this, we know they're committed to it, and we know that 10, 15 years from now when we come back to that community, that library is still going to be there because they made that upfront investment. I cannot emphasize how important this is to our model, to the long-term success, and anyone who's looking to do things in a community where you're going to put infrastructure in place, I think that community <coughs> co-investment is really critical. We also work with the community to create what we call library management committee. So from the very beginning, Community members are actually involved in deciding what's the library going to look like, where's it going to be located, what kinds of resources are going to be available within it. Um, we, we insist that the library management committee represent the entire community, so it shouldn't be only men or only highly educated people. It's got to have at least 33% women on the committee. It's got to represent all castes, all ethnicities, all religions that are present in a community. So that way, when people come to the center, they can see that this is, I, I belong here, because this actually represents, the people who are leading this initiative represent my whole community. So it doesn't matter if I ever went to school, it doesn't matter what my caste or situation is, 
you know, how much money I have. And, and that can be an issue sometimes when you come into a big, beautiful building, people who come from a less advantaged background sometimes can feel intimidated and they feel like this is not a space for me. But because the entire community is represented in managing this resource, everybody knows that it belongs to them and it's, it's good for them to go there and it's really a, a safe space for them. <laughs> Um, and, and on that note, I, I did want to just mention the fact that we do have communities that raise quite a lot of money for the Reed Centers. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll go to door to door and they'll ask everyone to contribute something. And that something might just be a handful of rice, but that's a really powerful gesture because then that family knows they contributed to that center. It really belongs to them. So it's, it's really critical to our model. Um, this picture I'll really quickly talk about was a fundraising campaign that happened in Nepal. It was the first time that we raised all of the money from within Nepal. None of the money came from outside of the country. They raised over 90,000 US dollars to build a library that opened just about a year ago. And it was an incredible undertaking. And it was actually raised by Nepalis, but for uh, people in another community. So it just shows the, the power of of the model that people want other uh, communities to have the Reed Centers. Safe spaces, this is a, a phrase I was hearing to my um, joy all throughout the morning, people talking about libraries as safe spaces. We've seen that especially for women, this might be the only place in the community where they're allowed to go without getting their husband's permission. And that's very powerful for women in rural villages, women who maybe are completely illiterate, who've never worked outside of the home, who didn't go to school. This gives them the opportunity to come, meet with other women, start supporting each other, talking about their common issues that they have, and then of course starting to access the different educational programs that are really gonna change their lives. Um, it's also a safe space, and this is actually a quote that, that came from um, some of the data collection that we did recently, but uh, we hear this from a lot of women, that this is really a safe space for them. Um, this is some of the women taking literacy classes. Oftentimes they form self-help groups. Um, they start creating microcredit organizations. So it's really just opening up so many opportunities for women. Um, we also hear, and this is one of the things I referred to earlier, that the Reed Center is a sacred space. It's a place where everybody's equal. We think of these as sort of neutralizing um, factors in the community because there's, you know, it doesn't matter what your background is, what your level of education, everyone's welcome. Um, and one of the things I've been hearing throughout the day also is this need for public-private partnership. And we've actually seen that Reed Centers are a perfect platform for partnership with both corporate um, entities and then also government. So this is an example that I wanted to highlight here in India. We've got a center in a community called Gijgar, which is in Rajasthan. We had built the center and then we entered into a four-year partnership with Walmart and um, it was quite a significant partnership. We ended up training about 2,000 women there how to sew and they're creating these reusable cloth shopping bags that are now being sold in the Easy Day stores um, and then soon in the, in the Walmart stores as well. Along with that business relationship, Walmart provided funding for literacy training, health education programs, so that this really became you know, an economic engine for the whole community, but it was actually uplifting hundreds of women at the same time. And actually the bags that you all received when you walked in today, the purple fabric bags, those were actually made um, by women in one of the reed centers. The fabric was actually woven in one reed center and then they were sewn into bags in a, in a center here in Delhi. So we're really excited that we were able to make that contribution to the center. Yeah. And, and of course, excited about the income that it provides for the women. <laughs> How many minutes does that mean I have? Do I have five minutes left? No, one minute more. One minute, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we love the fact that there's a lot of government programs that are already being provided for free, but sometimes there's just not a space in a community where those programs can be offered and accessed by people. This is a community in Nepal, in the Nuakot district. Once the library was open, the, the community was so happy to have this incredible resource that they set this very audacious goal of wanting to achieve 100% literacy in this community. So we partner with the government and of Nepal, and this is actually the woman who donated the land where the library was built. I'm happy to report this woman actually has learned to read. She's 80 years old and she came to the Reed Center, which just proves age is no issue. It's never too late to learn how to read. 
Um, this is a partnership in Bhutan. We're partnering with um, the Ministry of Agriculture, and I think this is something Ari, you referenced quite a lot. You know, we work in so many farmies community. There's there's so much need for agricultural training and support, and the library really becomes the perfect platform for that. And if I can just share one story, and then I will sit down. Um, this just sort of brings the the work that we do to life. Um, this is a woman by the name of Dashia, who is in the community of Jawani in Nepal. Um, she was completely illiterate. Her husband, that they, they were a very poor family. He actually had to leave Nepal to go work in Qatar and as a laborer, which is very hard work. Um, and when he left, he left her and her two children behind. She decided she was gonna go to her read center and learn how to read. So she first became literate. And then after she became literate and she started um, meeting with other women in these self-help groups, she decided to take some livelihood skills training. So she learned how to mushroom farm. And this picture here is her with a bunch of mushrooms that she grew. She um, was able to access microloan through the Reed Center. She started her own business. Um, in addition to the mushroom farming, she now has about 600 chickens. So she has a poultry cooperative. She does off-season vegetable farming as well. And as a result of all of the income that she's now earning, her husband was able to come home. She's earning 10 times as much as he used to earn. And their family unit is back together. They're able to send their children to school. Um, so it's just one example of, of you know, the women and the families that we've helped. And of course, there are millions more that, that we want to be able to help. So we hope that this model will really take hold and that other people will start to implement it as well. Thank you.